Hi nerds, my name is Robert. Welcome to Grok This. This is a YouTube channel where we design, build, and program homebrew computers from the ground up. I'm really excited about the project that we're starting today. We're gonna see if we can't start capturing the magic of the Commodore 64, the best-selling computer of all time in a new modern homebrew computer that we designed uh, together. So. Uh, I'm really excited to get started. Let's do this. For me, this project is about capturing the essence of the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64, when you, you set it on your desk, you plugged it in, uh, it had the keyboard on it already. You, there's not a lot to, to plug in other than like the monitor, uh, perhaps a joystick if you wanted to play a game. And it dropped you right into a, um, a command prompt, which was the basic programming language. The, the basic programming language was a very simple programming language, highly accessible. It came with a manual that described how to use the computer and it like the hardware was right there. And from basic, you could peek and poke the registers of the system and uh, basically control the computer and make it do what you wanted to do. I want to see if we can replicate that kind of like really tight closeness to the, to the hardware in a modern homebrew computer. So we're gonna go through all of the components that made the Commodore 64 what it was and uh, kind of see what kind of a modern version of a homebrew version of that would be. So let's get started. The first component that I think we need to talk about is the video. It had five official modes and then, um, but really they, these modes all fall into one of two categories. It had a character mode and a bitmap mode. And what a character mode, let me draw this up real quick. So uh, basically, the character mode um, splits the screen up into little squares that are the characters, and each character is eight by eight. So you have 40 characters wide on the Com Commodore 64 and 25 characters tall. So if each thing is, um, eight pixels, pixels wide, and apparently I can't draw and talk, then this is 320 pixels wide by 200 pixels tall, and that gives you 25 characters and 40 characters. So in memory, there's a, a character is an eight by eight little section of memory, and it had like, I'm just gonna make this up right here, because this, this is actually not drawn to scale. I don't have an eight by eight. I didn't draw eight by eight here, but you can kind of get the idea of this would be an A. And so what the VIC chip would do is, let's say you had the memory code for an A here. Well, it would take, it would, as it was scanning across here, drawing the screen, um, it would see this code and then it would look up all the values for that and draw that in, in, uh, on the screen. And so, the program is only manipulating a thousand values, 40 by, you know, 40 rows of 25. And so it can display that, the code, this being a not very, this is not a very fast processor by, certainly by modern standards. Um, but the code doesn't have to do as much work. And then the VIC2 chip takes all of the workload of translating these characters and looking up the corresponding uh, bits. Now, there's some limitations here and I think these are some of the things that I want to throw off uh, the limitations of the Commodore 64. So because of memory constraints, the VIC chip only has access to 8K or sorry, 16K of memory. And bottom line, it comes down to that 16K limits you to two colors, but you can't do two colors on all of the pixels. You just don't have enough memory. So you actually, each of these cells in character mode gets uh, the standard character mode, gets two colors, a foreground and a background. So the letters appear in one color and then the background draws behind it. Um, and that's all you get. And so you can have 16 colors on the screen, but each cell can only have two colors in it. 
So then uh, there's actually a couple of more modes. So there's the, um, there's the 300, this is the standard uh, character mode. So it is 320 by 200. So then you have the multicolor, uh, multicolor character mode. And so this, this one, the 320 by 200 gives you your 40 by 25. This one is 160 by 200. And you can see that this only gives you 20 uh, characters across by 225 uh, down. So basically it halves this dimension um, and doubles up all the characters. And what that allows you to do is it gives you, this gives you two colors. This one gives you four colors. And what it does is basically it halves the number of things, that, uh, a number of characters that you get, but it doubles the number of colors that you get. There's also a couple of bitmap modes. And it gives you 320 by 200, uh, two colors. So 320 by 202 two colors. And the difference here is that instead of writing 30, 25 by 40 characters and having the Vic chip do the translation into the, to the actual pixels, you actually just draw the 300 by 200 pixels. Again, you're limited to two colors, foreground and background. Again, you're limited to two, uh, two colors within an eight by eight cell, um, which so they're not characters anymore. You're directly drawing the data. You can actually then, do the multi-character, I mean multi-color, and it does the same thing at 160 by 200, and you get four colors. So lower resolution, double the colors, same thing. We have large amounts of memory comparatively available to us very cheaply. It's really hard to find components that, that don't have more memory than this. I think we want both a character mode and a bitmap mode. The thing about bitmap mode, that I forgot to mention is that bitmap mode is way more processor intensive. So the reason most games on the Commodore 64 sacrifice some resolution, but then they use the character mode, they can actually do a real time game in that with that kind of processing power because they would only need to do 20 by uh, 25 in that case. Whereas in bitmap mode, it takes a whole lot of CPU power to paint each frame. So there's huge performance benefits to that. So I think we wanna do the same thing. We wanna have character mode and we wanna have bitmap mode because uh, character mode's also a little bit easier to code and program for, you have less to deal with. I think though, we want to change it up a little bit. So 40 characters is kind of a hard limitation to deal with because a typical, let's, if you think of a page, if you're going to print off, like if you're going to do some, write up some sort of document and then print it off, um, that's actually 80 characters. You need 80 characters to have a full width. So any sort of like text editor you think of, 40 characters, even if you're not printing it, is going to really limit like how much text you can draw on a single screen. And so Typically 80 is what you need to, to do a full screen. So we should at least support that. Um, I also had the idea that perhaps let's have two, uh, the ability to have two screens of text side by side. So you're, you know, if you're imagining when I'm in my text editors, I like to have a screen on the left and a screen on the right where this is my reference information or I guess it would be <laughs> left and right for you, but this is my reference information and this is my uh, the actual text that I'm editing. The VGA standard has two modes that are interesting to us. So 1280 by 960 and 1440 by 900. So if you do the math, 160 by uh, 120. So this mode gives us this bottom mode here, this 1440 is interesting to me because it gives us 180 characters across the screen. So I imagine you have two, um, two, two panes of text, so that's 160. But then you also wanna have like a little spacing in between them so that they're not jammed right up against each other. So the extra 20 characters here kind of gives us a, a good number to shoot for and I can have you know, some borders, you know, text drawn borders, but uh, on the screen. So that's that's design. Design point number one is we want to be able to draw a VGA screen in either bitmap or in text mode at these resolutions. Now, 
there's one other key component that I want to mention here on the Vic chip supported uh, for performance reasons eight sprites. Now these sprites could were independent of all of this. So the Vic chip, you could hand it a 21 by 24 pixel sprite, just just a little image basically, and you could like position them together to create larger images and give give it eight of them to draw anywhere on the screen. And it would draw it super fast and it would be independent of what was behind it. And so you could layer these eight sprites um, and update the screen. Um, maybe we can come back and add, add it later if we want to, but I don't think we're gonna need it because uh, we're gonna operate at a much higher frequency. We're gonna have a little bit more horsepower under the hood, under underneath this processor. And I would like to avoid adding the complexity of supporting sprites if we can get away with it. In order to have a drive these, this video display that we, we've been talking about, we need to scale up the processor a little bit as well. So we're even in text mode, we have a lot more screen area and a lot more characters to manipulate. So we're gonna need an equivalent uh, increase in processing power. The 6510 processor that was in the Commodore 64 ran at about one megahertz. So I figure we're at least gonna need eight to 16 based on the ratio of number of pixels in the screen uh, that we have to deal with. So 320 by 200 is actually uh, 64,000 uh, 64, pixels. The 1440 by 900, let me just do this math real quick. That is 1.296 million pixels. So 20 times as much. So basically uh, we have 20 times as much many pixels to deal with. So let's just aim for like eight to 16 times um, in terms of speed. Uh, so we're going to use this USISC, um, MUSISC architecture um, and build a FPGA equivalent for it. So it'll be real hardware that's executing um, and it will drive, will output to VGA and drive real, be able to plug in a real monitor and, and, and all that. So that's what we're going to do. We're aiming for, I don't know, 8 to 16 megahertz. And based on my rough estimation, that's gonna give us uh, probably 16 to 32 times as much power as the uh, 6510. So the next component, so that is, let's, I guess we can get a checklist going here. We can go. Um, one of my next videos, probably the next video is actually, I'm gonna give an introduction to Musisk. And so uh, we'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to kind of program in Musis, kind of introduce you to the language. It only has two instructions, so it's really simple. So let's talk about memory. We're gonna give the processor a full 64K of words, which is 128K of bytes. But there's another thing that we wanna be able to do since we have larger screen real estate, um, we're gonna need more than this amount of memory. And so the processor has a banking system where you can, uh, the processor can see uh, different amounts of memory and you can actually give it up to um, 16 million words, uh, 32 megabytes of memory. Uh, the, the good news is that those chips are really cheap. There's no reason not for us not to give it access to that much because giving it access to less actually isn't even, isn't even like the, the chips aren't cheaper. Um, memories come so far, it's, it's, actually, it's actually hard not to give it more memory than it needs at this point. There's one other thing we wanna do is we wanna have some dedicated uh, video memory. And if you multiply the number of pixels, so uh, 1440 by 900, which uh, is one point, roughly 1.3 million pixels, 
Each one is going to be to a full 16 bits. We're gonna have 16 bits of color on this thing. And so it'll be, uh, you can double that for the number of bytes, so 2.6 megabytes of memory. Um, just to sh hold the screen RAM and then we need a little bit more uh, than that to hold the character mappings and some extra video data. So I'm guessing that we're going to end up with four to eight megabytes of bankable video RAM. Again, we'll go, I'll go into in other videos on how this banking system works. It's actually really simple. We have processor memory and now let's move on to there's a couple of extras that I want to give. Um, let's talk about sound first. The Commodore 64 had the SID chip, and the SID chip was kind of revolutionary for its time. It sounded better than pretty much anything else in existence at the time. That had, I think, what was it, three voices? Yep, three voices that had four different waves that you could kind of mix. And so th these synthesizers are where that kind of 8-bit computer sound comes from. The SID chip and a lot of the, the synthesizers of that area are not made anymore. So we're gonna have to figure out something. Um, and I'll just, for now, I'm gonna call it a SID alternative because I don't know what it's gonna be. We'll figure that out. So the keyboard, what I think we ought to do with keyboard, there's so, yeah, keyboard. Instead of having some sort of custom keyboard, I think we ought to just implement a USB driver. Let's have, be able to plug in a USB keyboard to this seems like the most flexible and if we do that then we can plug in other things later a mouse if we wanted to or um, USB thumb drives or anything like that there's a whole bunch of things that open up to us that we can connect to this computer if we could have USB basic just basic USB support um, joysticks I think we ought to do the same thing um, plug in to USB we can buy some basic game pads um, with you know the, the d-pad arrow keys and some joystick on it I think that's what we ought to use and and they we can buy a generic version that plugs into a USB port and support it that way so the Commodore 64 had a disk drive that you could get for it which load it could load data off of a five and quarter floppy or you could load data off of a cartridge I think we need to some sort of modern alternative most likely candidate here is an SD card uh, so we just plug in an SD card and then the, the ROM of the boot process will be able to load data off of that SD card. SD cards are actually really simple to interact with um, and they have the SD card readers that, with controllers and stuff that we can get cheaply. The Commodore 64 had a... Um, the ROM in the Commodore 64 the kernel and the basic interpreter took up about 9k of memory and we're going to need to do something similar. I think I think basically the the kernel will be imp implemented all of this will be implemented in in uh, Musis uh, the the assemb assembly language and what we'll do is we'll write a basic interpreter um, and and have the same kind of the paradigm that you have on the Commodore 64 where there's you boot into basic we should just be able to port basic programs into this really really simply um, so I want to do I want to have implement Commodore basic under the hood it's going to be new CISC assembly and um, we're gonna have a you know hopefully roughly about the same kind of 8 9k kernel um, I would like to add a new CISC assembly um, interpret our uh, compiler into that so add another few K for that uh, and then it'll be a homebrew computer that you can then build and design and run whatever programs you want on it. And eventually we're going to, I think one of the first projects we'll do is a simple game because games are fun. And in my opinion, there is no, um, there's no funner game to play than the one you made yourself. That's what we're going to do together. I invite you to come along, head over to Patreon, uh, Support me there, support this project, support this channel, and uh, we'll be next back in the next video, I think, probably, teaching you how to program in Musisk. I'm excited. For now, I'm signing off. Stay curious.